Well, welcome to another Bible study. And it's my voice here that you're hearing. Yes, don't edit the tape. <laughs> That's my voice right now. Um, this week is the last week of I Can Only Imagine. And after watching it, you'll see why I chose the one I chose. It's a little bit different from where um, people think I'd be going. But I see that theme keep pushing itself more and more and more when I watch the, the clip of the video. So let's watch the video. It's bad. Trying to decide where I want to sit. She wasn't sure. She was. I don't want to sit too close to him. Uh, you can sit I'm back here and sit. Does <laughs> that mean you're <clears throat> hugging me tonight? Huh? Ride to the station oh. to, like, how dare you play this song? Like it was. Oh, that I was watching. Yeah, how dare you play that song? So for about a year, we never sang it live. Then we were at a camp, and the speaker was like, hey, can you do that Imagine song? We're like, we don't know it. Like, we 
we've never played it. So while he's preaching, we're behind the curtain, quietly trying to learn our own song that we'd never played live. And when the curtain opened, we played it. The spotlight's hitting us in the face, couldn't see or hear anything. When we finished, there was no applause, nothing. It was dead quiet. And I remember looking at each other going, this was the worst decision ever. And then when the lights came up, like most of the crowd was at the altar on their knees crying. We're like, what is happening? And I guess we've played it every night since. People were asking, like, why, why did this song do what it did? Why do you think it, it reached so many people? And I'm like, man, I think ultimately most people can agree that they hope that there's something better after this. If they've lost a loved one, they hope that they're in a better place. And I think people embrace that hope. After Imagine kind of ran its course in Christian music, there was a top 40 station. They were doing this truth or dare kind of shock jock, kind of Howard Stern kind of morning thing. And they were doing truth or dare, which was supposed to be like this vulgar, perverted thing they were doing in the air. And someone called and dared them to play Imagine. Their own fans started dogging them like, oh, it's something you won't do. So they got a copy of it and they played it. All of a sudden the phone started ringing off the hook. It became like the number one song on their station for like six months. Well, in that, one of the stories they told us was there was a lady that was about to take her life. She had decided to run her car off a bridge. She's listening to Wild 100, Imagine Plays, and she gets incredibly angry at the song. So much so that she's decided to put that on hold and drive to the station to, like, how dare you play this song? Like, it was totally messing up her plan, I don't know in traffic she I think I want to say she saw a billboard of a Christian radio station and knew maybe they could explain why this dumb song is being played called them because the mainstream wouldn't answer the lines are busy because people kept calling in so she called to say she could find how why does this song exist how dare you why would you have them play to mainstream like it works that way and they're like we don't know what you're talking about and then they kept talking are you okay are you okay and then she's like I just don't understand it and then they eventually led her to Christ that by the time she did get to the mainstream station, she hugged the guy's neck in tears and said, if you wouldn't have played that, I wouldn't be here. We had a chance to play at Fort Hood in Texas for the troops that caught Saddam Hussein were coming home. And it wasn't just them, there were several soldiers coming home. And so we played and this one officer came up and just embraced us. We could barely understand what he was saying because he was crying so hard. And he said he lost his whole company. He's the only one to survive. And he said he spent the whole night with a loaded gun and imagined playing Phil Walkman, contemplating whether to take his life or not. And he goes, I decided it wasn't worth it. To be asked to play at Fort Hood, I'm freaking out. Like, these are, like, real heroes. And the last thing he said, because you're, you're the biggest hero in my life to us. I heard just crying, going, no, 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 no. I'm like, I'm out of shape. I, you know, I like Doritos a lot. And like, okay. I was like, you're the hero. It was really overwhelming to have him say that to us. And, that the song kept him from doing something crazy like that. It was, yeah. I've been consumed with heaven for a very long time. You know, I don't know how it all works. Do I think that we're going to cross over Jordan and there's some streets of gold and stuff? Honestly, I probably not. I tend to believe that whatever John was seeing in Revelation was he was describing it with the most precious things he could possibly comprehend, whether it was gold or whatever he's seeing, there's no other words to put it than it looked like this. And the tools I'm given to describe things, he's describing it as best he knows how. it says we've already been placed in the heavenlies which means somehow in past tense part of me is already there I don't know if I ever just assumed that he's going to place us in the heavenlies or whatever but the fact that we're already there that if part of heaven is no more separation from Christ then in a way heaven's kind of begun there, there are parts that we don't see clearly but at the same time we're no longer separated from Christ and, I, and I'm not trying to say there's not a place where our loved ones are I believe all that is, is, takes place but but the fact that we, we, nothing can take us out of the hand of Christ, that nothing's going to change, even on our worst day, we know what our outcome is, is, is one of his. You know, that's, that's a pretty awesome thought that, uh, that in a way it kind of has begun. Heaven is kind of here in a, in a sense. 
Corinthians 2, 2, it says, I've determined to know nothing while I'm with you except Jesus Christ and crucified. And I can't tell you how many times I've said that while getting beaten, while being abused, and the things I've gone through, just, it's almost like you just kind of zone out and just keep clinging to that. This is what it's about. It's still kind of the hope I embrace, I hold on with heaven is that, you know, no matter what gets to me, it's like I'm determined to know nothing with this. You know, whether it's thinking about my dad and what's to come and talking about heaven or whatever I'm going through now, I'm determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. If there are people that are watching this or whatever and thinking, man, I'm, I'm intrigued by this, but uncertain. And the Bible says if we believe and confess our sin and believe, then, then we can be saved. I think there's a moment when you just choose to believe, God, this is real, and I, I want you to be a part of this story and who I am. And even if we don't get the words right, I think God's faithful to see the heart and to do his part, so to speak. A day with, without having faith that there's something after this just kind of feels like a wasted day to me. And so it's just what I choose to believe. If it turns out that I'm wrong, then a better life has been lived because of it. I know what I was before and I know what I am now. I know what my dad was before, you know, encountering Christ. But you can argue the semantics of it all and if God exists or whatever, but the thing that can be argued is what he's done in my life. And it's uh, probably the most real thing I've ever seen. I think the idea of us believing that we're a part of something bigger improves our quality of life here. Just believing it's not just about us. I think the idea of that it doesn't just end and we're put in the ground and that's it. How does that not impact the way you live now? I think deep down we want to believe there's something more. I have to believe that. Knowing that I'm a part of something bigger, knowing that it's worthwhile to get out of bed in the morning and tell people about the gospel rather than just some songs that have no meaning or point and things eternal just seems kind of empty to me. I love the idea of having hope and embracing the fact that I'm going to see my dad again. I took this picture here. It's a nice looking picture. I said this this gives us a chance to think I can only imagine you looking up into the clouds and having there. It's a beautiful picture, so I thought about that. But after watching that clip, I mean there were a couple of things that stood out to me, but there was one theme that kept repeating over and over and over and over again to me, and I couldn't do anything about it but just to speak on it today. And it is this Is God still speaking? Because when you looked at the movie, there were different things that were happening in the movie. And you see where God was speaking to people with various forms and stuff like that. So, I wonder how many persons know or think or wonder if God is still speaking. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. Is God still speaking? Now, does God still communicate with humanity? I need to ask that question. Does God still communicate with humanity? Is God still speaking? Don't all answer at once now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because you have um, certain religions that are preaching or teaching now that um, if God is to talk with humanity, it has to come through a certain channel. Like some pastors preach now, it has to come through him. So in other words, if all you want to hear from God, you have to come to me. 
That's all God tell me to tell Audrey. That's a waste of time. Because if this God is everywhere and all over the place, why do I have to drive come to church to hear from me to hear from him? It doesn't make any sense. So that is something we need to look at and think about. Yes, most definitely, God is still speaking, right? Now, how does God communicate with humanity? No, I'm not going to ask you to answer that one. I'll answer it for you. The best way I know how. Any way he chooses, he's God. Because some people want to tell you, I want to dictate how God communicates with us. And I was, oh, I was asking somebody, when I left here, it's so happy that I had a conversation with this with somebody. And they were telling me that God speak to them and somebody was telling them, no, God didn't speak to them. Who are we to tell persons that God didn't talk to them? I didn't know God has to check in with us before he talks to persons. Right? So he chooses any way he wants to communicate with anybody. It's his earth. It's his place. You don't need to check in with anybody. Right? Now, ways of communication. I'm not saying this is the only ways that he communicates. I'm saying this is some of the ways, and these are the ones that we're going to look at. Right? The word, I mean the Bible, still strong, still relevant. That's one way. Signs. Oh yeah, God's still giving signs. I know some people are like, well, that's old time days. Okay, we'll see. Right? Direct. That means he talks, still talks to people direct. Some people are like, uh-uh. That one not happening anymore. That's old school. And indirect. He still talks to the person. That means he sends somebody to you. Now, I know the question most people are asking here. Which one is the most common way? Right? Well, let me answer for you that one for you very easily. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which one is the most common way. Because as I said to somebody, if you live in America and say and they say, what's the most common car in the world? Person in America might say, Chevy. Everybody knows that. And then you go over to France and you say, what's the most common car in the world? And the person say, a Pijou. And everybody, I know some of you looking at me, what the heck is a Pijou? That's the name of a car. <laughs> It's not a bird, it's a car, right? I know Pijus, I used to drive a Piju at one point. Never old one, but I drove one before. So, the person in France thinks the most common car is a Piju because that's their side of the world. And opposed to the person in America think a Chevy is the most common car in the world because that's their side of the world. If we want to know the most common car in the world, we have to check every country, every world, you know, in the world to put all the different cars together and then we might hear of a car that we never even heard of might be the most common car so in other words god is the only one that's all over the world so how we might communicate to us here in the united states might not work in china so while we think oh yeah this is the best way for god to communicate he might be doing something different in africa so which one is the most common i don't know that's up to god leave those stats to him that's not for me to decide Right now, in the movie, there were examples of God speaking. Now, there are other areas in the movie where God was speaking. I just draw some randomly so that people could see that. Um, you saw when Bart saw the brochure about cancer, remember that? That brochure spoke to him, and when he saw that, he stopped in his track and see, he realized his dad was dying. So, that was a part there where God was speaking. The dad listening to church on the radio and coming to God. Don't knock them radio, tell you about them evangelists now, them radio guys doing some good work, right? And don't knock all of them there that come out on the TV, not all of them want your money. <laughs> As I told somebody this morning, be careful how you say the TV evangelist persons are all robbers. Because remember now I'm on social media too, so that includes me. So you got to be careful because if you say they're all robbers, you're saying I'm a robber too. But his dad listening on the radio, that was God speaking. Remember when Shannon, his girlfriend, said to him, well, at that time she wasn't his girlfriend because he had left her. She said, I'm still praying for you. That stopped him in his tracks that he had to think. That again was God speaking to him. Right? Seeing, imagine on every book he opened as he opened the page. And that was a reality in his life. Not just the movie that he said every page he turned to, he saw imagine. Right? And so that's how the song came about. That's God speaking to him. And there was another one. Imagine becoming the number one song when they're on their last check from his dad. Now, if that's not God speaking, I don't know what it is. 
because somebody you're on the phone with somebody to do an interview and your wife saying this is the last check we're going to get what are we going to do and then the other person on the line saying hey your song just reached number one so money is coming in that's god speaking and so as far as i'm concerned god is still speaking now let me look at this one yep i'm about to roll into a little rabbit hole here but just give me a second and don't start stoning me until i tell you what i'm doing <laughs> Now, listen to this. God does not speak to us through prayer. I saw I went. <laughs> now, I know everybody's like, what the crap did this man just say? And you're like, stone it, get him out of the church, blasphemy. That's what the Jews would say. <laughs> Take him outside and stone him, right? Well, give me a second. He communicates with us when we pray. But he doesn't speak to us through prayer. Let me, let me explain a little bit before you all start, you know, getting ready to cast the first stone. Now, if we need God, what we do? We pray to him, right? Now, if, if, so that means prayer is not the way God uses to contact us, to get our attention. Because if he needs us, he don't pray to us. You see, when I was talking there that God does not speak through prayer, I was using speech through the contact way. Like for instance, I might say, hey Lynette, how is everything? And he says, oh, I got a cold. And I'm like, oh, I hope you feel better. We're talking, we're communicating, I'm speaking to her. But then, if I want Lynette and she's way over there, I say, Lynette, come here. I'm still speaking to her, but it's in a different way. Right, so there's a time when I was communicating to her and the other time when I was calling for her. The best way I can put this so you can understand is this. You have a king, and the king is on his throne. And when you want to see the king, what do you do? You ask and say, can I get the king's attention today? And they say, we'll see if he's free, and whatever. And then you come in and you see the king, you make your petition, and whatever, and then the king dismiss you. But if the king wants to see you, <coughs> the king don't say, I wonder if Mario will see me today. No, the king says, send for Mario. <coughs> you get what I'm saying? So that's the best way to put it. So you can now breathe a sigh of relief. He didn't give you blasphemy. He didn't tell you, God, that you don't talk when, he, when you pray. He's just saying he don't speak to you to call you to get your attention through prayer because God don't pray to us. We are humanity. And we need to remember that. And people don't know this. And they, they, they keep on saying, you know, God speak to us through prayer. No, God communicate with us. And we need to remember to tell people that. Right? Because when we want him, he does not pray to us. Right? And we need to remember, he is the king. Not the other way around. That's the little rabbit hole. I just wanted you guys to know that. Because, you know, sometimes people say some things from the pulpit, even pastors. And I've been hearing that a whole lot. And let me tell you, remember, we don't pray, we, God don't pray to us. So when he wants us, he summons us. That's the good thing right here. So let's get back. Off the rabbit track now. The word, let's look at the word. The word of God is used to reach people all over the world. Listen, the word of God, it is sufficient to point man to God's saving grace. I tell persons, even if you don't understand the rest of it, <laughs> like the man said, Lipticus, what's in Lipticus? I don't get that. I understand, my brother. Some people still don't get it either. Some people don't even bother to read the book of Revelation because it's too hard. What I'm saying, it still will point you to find God and you'll get salvation through it. That's it. It's sufficient for that. Right? It inspires and gives wisdom and how one should live a life according to God's standards. Listen, I know persons don't believe in God, don't believe in the Bible, but then they're talking to you and tell them something is going wrong and they say, don't the Bible say? Well, tell me the Bible say, you don't even believe in God. I was watching an interview the other day with, they have this religion in Jamaica called the Rastafarian, you know, the ones that don't plait their hair and it comes all down. And you know, they believe in Selassie and all that. And he on the interview and he's like, Joe Rastafari, yeah, Selassie. And then after reading the middle of the interview, and the Bible says, and I'm like, excuse me? <coughs> the Bible says what? Don't tell me what the Bible says, because you don't believe in that. But. The fact of the matter is the Bible inspires and gives wisdom even for people who don't even believe in it. 
because it's such a good book, it's such a good read, that they still read it, even though they don't like it, and they still quote from it, right? It holds answers to many of life's questions. Some things you can't figure it out, you turn to the Bible, and it tells you. Have a little problem with your love life? Turn to Solomon. <laughs> He'll give you the answers. He tells you how to serenade a woman and all of that. You know? it's, everything is there in the Bible. It is still relevant today as it was in the past. I learned something about the Bible, and it's this. When I was growing up, I used to tell like my mother, I would say, well, what you say about the Bible is old school. It's a modern time now. And it must need some different things to reach us. Well, when I read the Bible, the same things that she used to read, I'm still reading it. And it's still helping me. And guess what? When I stop reading it, my car going to read it too. And it's the same thing that I read going to help it. It's the same thing. It's relevant today. It's relevant tomorrow. It's relevant for the future. The Bible doesn't go bad. It's like it's alive. And it is. Now, let me tell you something about the Bible. You can Google these stats. I love Googling them just for the fun of it to see it come up on the screen. It is still the number one selling book of all time to date. That means up to today. <laughs> still the number one selling book of all time. Let me give you another stats. It's still the number one red book of all time to date. <laughs> yeah. So even though people are telling you that the Bible is false, the Bible is fake, about still in print. I mean, it, copies are still being printed at this book. What? Don't there is enough Bible in the world yet? Well, people still printing, still people still buying Bibles, still people still reading Bibles. So it's still being read, still the number one of all times. No, God was speaking through His Word in the past. He used His Word to talk to persons. He's still speaking through his word in the present and he will still be speaking through his word in the future. Now, unless God stops it and whatever, then the word will stop speaking. But as far as I know, this word is going to continue and stand forever. That's the only thing. So the word is still good, still relevant, and still alive speaking to persons. Now, I want to share from scripture. This scripture here that I'm about to share I put it on the amplified version so you can see it. it puts everything into perspective so you can know how strong and how good the, God, the word of God is to help us as Christians. It says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17, every scripture is God breathed, that means given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, yeah, because we need some instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin for correction of error and discipline in disobedience and for training in righteousness in holy living in conformity to God's will in thought purpose and action man that alone sums everything up because everything that you're thinking for was in that statement already and you know why all of that comes from the word? It says, so that the man, and man there means woman too. It's a general man there. When you put that word up. So that the man of God may be complete, proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, the word of God is putting us in training, keeping us in line. It's doing everything that we need. So if we spend time in this thing, it's going to make us a better Christian. I said this, and this is the truth. I've never known one person to have read the word of God and come out the worst. I don't, even if they're not a Christian, I don't know anybody that has read it and said, man, it's a waste of time. Even my atheist friends say to me, you know, the Bible has some good stuff in there, you know, but they change something, so some part of it is not good. Yes, yeah, some part of it, but he's going to tell you that the other part is good. So I've never met anybody that never had something that said there is some good in it or met anybody that read it and became worse. Never. If there is somebody, let me know. Right? Now, when you look in the book of Hebrews, this shows you how powerful the word of God is. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Look what it says. For the word of God is living. That means he ain't dead. I told you it's alive. It's living and active and full of power 
making it operative. That means it's still working. It's not just words on a page. It's still working. It's still doing stuff. As a matter of fact, it makes us operatives. That means we work for the word. Because we go and do what it says we should do. So like secret agents of the Bible. <laughs> right? Energizing and effective. Listen what it says about it. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Penetrating as far as the vision of the soul. So it's going deep within man. And the spirit. And the completeness of a person. When the word hits you, you can't hide from it. Sometimes when you hear some messages coming from the word, and you're like, come on, come on. Stop, stop playing my screen. Stop playing everything on the screen. Because you're wondering if the pastor is looking into your life. It's just the word of God. Right? And it says, completeness of a person. And of both joints and marrow. Listen, it cuts so deep, it goes to joints, in your joints and in your marrow. You know where your marrow is? In the brain. <laughs> so it goes all the way up into the marrow. The deepest parts of your nature. And what it does, exposing and judging the very thoughts, even what you're thinking the Bible telling you that that is wrong, and intentions of your heart. So even if you don't say it out loud, the Bible will say, yeah, this is what you're thinking. This is a powerful tool. And we have to realize that the Bible, God's still using it to speak then, still using it to speak now. And we have to remember how the powerful tool we have, I use it. I tell persons, somebody asks me, I can't understand everything on the Bible. I said, well, don't read the entire Bible. And they're like, what did you say? I said, read the parts that you understand. And when you read the parts that you understand, and when you've grasped that, Start studying the parts that you don't understand, go to a class, go to something and get help. But you still need to read it. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Alright. Moving to the other one. Is God still speaking? God uses signs. Thank you. He uses signs. God uses signs of any sort, of any kind, in any way to speak to us. Will you believe that? Thank you. <laughs> right? All things are at his command and are subject to him. Think about that. All things are at his command and are subject to him. Right? Nothing is beyond the scope of being used to give us a sign. Some people want to say, God will never use that. God will never do that. God will never use that person. God will never... Again, who says God has to check in with us? God doesn't have to check in with anybody. Right? The problem we have with science is sometimes we don't read them very well. You know? We reach out here at the edge of Tulpa Hawking Road and we roll over and the cop pulls us over. Why did you stop at the stop sign? Where? There was a stop sign. We're looking all over the place. We did not read the signs very well. But guess what? Sometimes it's not read, we don't read the signs. We do this. Come on now, people. We ignore the signs. Yeah, so God is giving us a sign, you know, Rochelle put the brakes on, this is not the person for you. And we're like, what, what God, what, what? I didn't hear you, what did you say? What, what? <laughs> and so sometimes we ignore the signs. Listen, sometimes we believe the signs are not for us. And so Carol is there, and, and, and Audrey says to Carol, well, I'm struggling with this thing, you know. I remember the last time we spoke and you said we were struggling, with, but I got this sign. And Carol is like, well, that's for you. It's not for me. Both of them struggling with the same thing. So we sometimes want to say the signs are not for us. So we're saying God is not speaking to us or giving us the signs. Right? But signs even come in form of dreams and visions. I know some people don't believe this, but listen to me. When God wants to tell you something when you're asleep, he'll tell you. You go to your bed. And you go right nice and then you're having a good night's sleep. And then I told people that's the first time I saw a flat screen was in my head. <laughs> when I'm sleeping and God start playing out some stuff and I wake up in the morning, I'm like, okay, I know what I need to do. So he'll send them in the form of dreams. He'll send them in the form of visions, right? No, the problem is this. What do we do when God gives us signs? Because this is the thing, we don't read them. And I took three signs here, even though they're Christian signs, but they kind of have different meanings. Like, for instance, the one over there, sometimes God gives you a clear crystal cut sign that you don't need it. You know what I mean? It's clear. Stop and pray. 
You know, it's right there, bold red flashing letters, stop. And we like walk right past it. And then sometimes he gives us a sign that causes us to think. What am I doing? So look at this one, it says, cars are not the only thing recalled by their maker. What that mean? Oh, yeah. It's a good sign, isn't it? I like that one. I like that. I should put that out in front of the church. <laughs> but it's a good sign. Then, sometimes you have some signs that tell you that what you need to do, right? So this one is telling you, like, Christian under construction. So you realize, oh, I need to pray. I need to turn myself back over to God because I'm probably not living the way I should. So signs can be in any way, any form, but we need to understand when God sends us signs. Now, I don't talk about the burning bush, because everybody knows that sign, but I could not leave this sign out. The sign of the rainbow. That sign is like one of the oldest one that there is, and still being used today. Can you imagine God, and I tell people this, you know, people need to really watch the Bible, you know. The Bible told us about the rainbow before science explained it. People miss that. Science explained how the rainbow was made. Years after the rainbow was in the word of God. And they still gave it the same name. Oh! <laughs> God invented the rainbow. They told us how it comes from it. Water particles hit the sun and all of that. And blah, blah, blah. And they still call it the rainbow. Because God gave you that name? Oh! So look at that. Genesis 9 verse 13. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, I used to live in a place where when it rained hard, 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 overly hard, water walked through the house. The water would come sometimes anyway up to my chest here. So we had to evacuate. It was terrible, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, he was a baby then. He had to come out many times. And so, one of the things I learned about living in that place, I'll be looking, you know, from way up on another street on the hill, and I'd see my house near the water, you know, covering, almost covering the house, and I'm looking at it and stuff like that. And then sometimes after the rain finished, I would say, beautiful rainbow. Yeah, the mud and everything is still there, but it's a beautiful rainbow. And I would say to myself, huh, my house is underwater, but not everywhere else on the earth is. It made me feel better. Because my house was underwater, but God says he's not going to destroy the earth with water anymore. So that means I can find somewhere else to live that no water is going to come to. Ah! <laughs> which, which I did. <laughs> which I did. <clears throat> I found a house on a hill. So remember, it's true. You can ask me, God, the house that we have, that we have walk up to like this. <laughs> Makes me feel better. So he set the rainbow in the clouds, and that's just a sign. Again, I took this one because I want people to understand some signs are crystal clear. We need to remember that. But not all signs are crystal clear. Some signs we don't understand. And we have to get help. And if you don't understand the sign, go pray. Go ask for help. Ask somebody to help you pray and find out what's going on. Now we're going to talk about this little guy here. Belshazzar. Now let me tell you something about Belshazzar. And I didn't know this was going to tie in back to what we did. Remember when we talked about Nebuchadnezzar? That guy there, Nebuchadnezzar was the one that, you know, got mad. God made him mad and he was eating from the grass like oxen and he looked like bird and his ear grew over because he disrespected God. Finally, he came to God. Now, God gave him back his throne and he came to God and said, God is the real God and he's an awesome God and stuff. This is his son. Now, look at this. His son saw that happen to daddy. Some people say this is his grandson. I'll still take that. But his relative, but I think it's his son based on the scripture, based on the genealogy I did. When he saw his dad go crazy and then come back and said, God is God. He should have learned from that and stuck with God. Dummy didn't. Never learned anything <laughs> from that. So look what Dummy did. Yeah, I, I, no, I, this is the truth. Look what Dummy did. Dummy got his friends I said, let's get the things that were taken from um, the place now in um, Jerusalem's temple. Let's eat and drink and have some fun with them. So this is where the story picks up. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king, listen, who drinking and having fun on Titan party? The king, his nobles, his wives, 
and his concubines. Everybody in this party. This is the big shindig, man. Right? So everybody's there. And they praise the gods. This is how much gods they are praising. The gods of gold, the gods of silver, of bronze, of iron, of wood, and of stone. From the real gods thing. Oh yeah, God was mad, mad upset with him. And look what happened. It said, suddenly, there were fingers of the human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. Can you imagine? <laughs> you see a hand just come out of the door and start writing on the wall? I don't, I don't know. Listen, look at this. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Now when you look in some of the other more detailed writings, how they described him, he could have wet himself or pooped himself. That's how scared he was. Now I told persons, if I'm doing something wrong and I see a hand come on and start writing on the wall, I could have wet myself and pooped myself too. Give me some defense, man. You never know what's going to happen. But this is what happened to the king. And guess what? He couldn't figure out the sign. He looked at it, he looked at it, and he didn't know what the sign meant. So what did he do? He called for the smart people. And he said, smart people, tell me what this sign means. Well, they couldn't tell him either. So they, he had to call Daniel, which he had thrown away. Right? And that's why I said it more likely is his son. Because if it was his grandson, Daniel would probably be dead by then. But it is his son. And so he called for Daniel, and Daniel could still come up and tell him because he was serving under his father, but he had sent him to the back. And now Daniel came and said, listen, let me tell you. King, I'm so sorry. I just got to tell you this. God says, hey, you're founded in one because you messed up. And today, today, you're going to be murdered. You're going to be killed. And he made Daniel a big robe, gave him gold chain around the neck and promoted him that very night. That very night, he was killed. And you know, many people don't know, but let me give you a little nugget here. This is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. I'm going to tell you why. When you read this scripture right here with Belshazzar and everything, this is where the scripture and history, not his, biblical history, no, history, history, line up together and come as one. Because when you read this and it tells you what happened to Belshazzar, and you read the historical data, they were trying to get in Babylon and they couldn't get in the city of Babylon. And then what they did, they tried and tried till they found a way in through the water channel that run under the, the wall. And that's how they, it's in movies too, yeah, it's, it's a true story. So they found there and that's how they got into attack Babylon. You see those, some of those movies and you see they walk through the water channel in that movie, it was this they were talking about, it's a historical thing. And so the Bible pinpoints that exactly. And that very same night, he was killed. And the Bible said, the kings, the Persians, and the Medes took over. Remember when you, all that movie, Troy? It's coming from all of this. <laughs> yeah, it's coming from all of this. So all of that happened when the kings and Medes took over. That's why when people said, no, Daniel could not serve under so many kings. He would be dead already. Well, the same night... When he was killed, the same night a new king was appointed from the Persian Medes because they took over. And so he saw Daniel in the pretty robe, the pretty gold chain, and everything. I said, oh, this is one of the wise men. Keep him. Now you see why Daniel was back in front of the king again. Hey! Exact! With history. And they tried to refute it, but they can't come around it. I'm telling you, Bible. Woo. I was just another nugget here. Let's keep on going now. <laughs> right? No. Let me tell you this. Signs are so important that sometimes a sign will change on your perspective, how you look at things. I remember I was going through a rough time. I was here. I was about to preach a Sunday morning, and things weren't looking good. I was struggling with something that I was praying about, and I didn't see God coming through for me. And, you know, you can get discouraged. Now I'm about to preach, and I'm like, God, I need a miracle. I need you to do something for me. Oh, my gosh. And so I... Left my office open, I went to the bathroom, and when I came back, somebody had snuck into my office and put down on my table a little bracelet looking thing. I got it in my pocket now, and it says, Expect Miracles. 
Now, if that ain't a sign, I don't know what is, because I didn't tell the persons who I was talking in my mind. And that was what I got. And why was I felt when I went up and I preached the word of God that I did get my miracle. Woohoo! So I'm telling you, signs are there, but we need to read the signs. Now, everybody in Christendom believes God speaks to people in the Bible. This is direct now. Just like I'm talking to Carl. Hey, Carl! Carl says, hey, Pastor! Everybody in Christendom, every Christian believes, yes, God speaks to everybody in the Bible. But... <laughs> Not everyone in Christendom believes God speaks to people. No, directly. Talk to many persons with it and they said that is old time days, it is done with. And I said to them, Can you just show me the scripture that says God stopped talking to people now directly? Well, 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 you have to understand those days are different from I agree that those days are different from now. Heck, 20 years ago when I was a kid. No, I still was old. Uh, 30 years ago when I was a kid, forgot I'm 40 something now. Uh -huh. 30 years ago when I was a kid, it's different from what now being a kid is. Right? So don't tell me the days are different. God doesn't change. We change. Right? So who are we to say God stops speaking directly to a person? I don't know. I didn't see any scripture. Show me the scripture. If you can't show me the scripture, then leave it alone. Stop telling people how and what God says as if he checks in with you. Right? It doesn't check in with you. It is okay for God to speak to Peter, James, and John. Yeah, they're in the Bible. Yep, God talked to Peter, James, and John. They're apostles. But guess what? It's not okay to talk to Denise, Eric, and Tessa. <laughs> you know, I just picked some names that right now. Denise in the kitchen all the time. No, God ain't going to talk to Denise. She's just, it's just Denise, you know. No, don't talk to Eric. <laughs> Eric, no, no. Tessa, Tessa's a little girl. God won't talk to her. Why would God talk to her? And you know why I found out why some persons can't accept that God is talking to other persons? Because they don't hear his voice. And they're kind of like, if God is talking to Russia, why isn't he talking to me? I'm a better Christian than her. We already know why I know he's not talking to you. Because you think you're a better Christian. <laughs> you got pride in your life. So that's the reason why. So don't say who of you God talked to. He don't check in with you. Where in the Bible did it say God has stopped speaking directly? I've asked that question a million and one times. Still can't get the answer. And I ask this. Who gave us authority to determine who God can speak with? Mm -hmm. So I always say, you know, me and my wife, we're very close. Wonderful. And we always get along. Not all the time, but most times. <laughs> but we're very close and we talk about everything. No, if God wants to talk to my wife, as close as we are together, God not to speak to me. He go talk to her. And if God wants to speak to me, he's not going to go and say, oh, Michaela, can I go talk to Mario? Hmm. No! So who are we to determine and say we have the authority? We don't have any authority. God does what he wants and speaks to who he wants. <coughs> now, I want to give you this one here. 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 10. And I took this one <clears throat> because this was a little kid. And that's the reason why I took this one, right? Because sometimes people, there are many areas in the Old Testament where God spoke to persons. Nobody disputes that. But I chose the one with the kid because I want people to understand that he chooses who he wants to speak to. I know what was happening here was that the man of God who was mentoring this kid was doing a terrible job with his own kids. He had two sons, Hophni and Phineas. Who, yeah, Hophni and Phineas. I know it's a cartoon character, but really and truly, yes. it's really from the Bible. See, sometimes you don't know when these cartoons pull these names from. Hophni and Phineas are two bad priests. So they were stealing from God. They were taking bribes. They were doing everything. And Eli know. And when people say, fix your sons, Eli's like, And turn a blind eye to it. So this is what was happening with Hophni and Phineas here. So God got Samuel involved. So what happened now? God is not talking to, to Eli as much. Says that God says, You know your sons ain't right. You know you're supposed to do better. So I only talk to you when I feel like. That's why I started the scripture here. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, remember there's a temple, there's a man of God. Look what it says. In those days, 
the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. In other words, God not talking to the man of God too much. And I told persons, a pastor can be on, in front of everybody. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen. I don't have a clue with God. And the church run right now. I've seen it. Because they're not living right. And so they're not in connection with God. Even though they're still in the church every Sunday and pray and preach. So you have to be careful of that. So this is what was happening here. But we all know the story. You know, God came and said, you know, Samuel, Samuel, eventually Eli realized, oh my gosh, this must be God. Kid ain't crazy. And he told him what to say. And the Lord came and stood there, calling as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. Let me tell you what he told a kid. He told a kid, listen, I'm going to use you to do some mighty things in Israel. And listen what? You see that guy that's mentoring you now? I'm going to wipe him off the face of the earth. Nobody going to be left in his family. No male. So he can't even say his name is not going to be said anymore. I'm cutting his generation off. And God did that. He killed Hophni and Phineas, Right? And they didn't have any more boy babies. <laughs> and then afterward, Eli, I think he fell off the chair and broke his neck or something like that. When he heard that his sons died, he fell off his chair. So that was it. Eli generation finished. But God telling... A kid, all of that, and some people are like you can't tell a kid that. Eh? Well, go tell God. He told a kid. I'm just saying. Then we look in the New Testament, because some people might say, "Well, I, I know he probably did it in the New Testament." Well, let me tell you this one. This is God the Father speaking to John. And I know some people are saying, "But how did John see God's face?" We read Revelation. Never said he saw God's face, you know. When you read Revelation, he says he couldn't look at certain things. It was there. And secondly, when he was there, he was in the spirit. Ah, only God can separate the spirit from the body. <laughs> so for the people who are saying, how can man look on God's face and live? The scripture said that it wasn't his physical body. So I got two packages for that. Let's go back now. And this is John here now. Talking to God the Father. Can you believe this? Directly. And if you don't believe, listen to this conversation. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, look, I am making all things new. Also he said, write this down. He's dictating to John. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And just in case you're not sure, then John said, And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's a whole lot more. But I just wanted you to see what the Father was talking to him. They might say, well, how are you sure that wasn't Jesus? But if you read Revelation a little bit more, he talks about the Lamb when the Lamb came and opened the scroll and doing all the reading. That was Jesus that time. This is God the Father. Yeah. So God taught directly to John. Who are we to say God don't talk directly to person still? No. Let me tell you this. Right? Jesus also made an appearance in the New Testament. Jesus taught directly to Paul. Remember we did that story the other day? Paul on the way walking. And he says, he says, oh, the bright light. And Jesus says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, who are you, Lord? Jesus was directly clear. It is me, Jesus of Nazareth, that you are persecuting. So I called you directly. So, we have Jesus making a talk directly to Paul, a murderer, and converting him. Whoa. So, we know that God does that. No, I've always said this, and this is true. Remember, if you see something in the Old Testament, and then you see it repeat in the New Testament, pay attention. That means this thing ain't stopping, it's still going. It didn't just stop and there was a big break. It kept on going. So, did it in the Old Testament? Did it in the New Testament? Right? Why, why can't do it now? Did he lose the power? No, he didn't. He's still doing what he's doing. So don't let anyone tell you that God has stopped doing what he's doing or stopped talking to anybody. Don't let him, nobody tell you that. Unless God himself tell you, I stop talking directly to people. Or unless 
God put it in the word that, hey, I stopped talking directly to persons. So nobody must be able to tell you that. Don't let anybody tell you stuff like that. Now, finally, this one. God will use individuals to speak to you indirectly. Now, he's been doing this for years. He does it for years, way back in the Old Testament. It's one of the oldest ones. And so he sends somebody to come talk to you, right? Listen, he uses angels. He uses people. Even animals, if he wants. And I heard some people say, well, yeah, the donkey talked one time. <laughs> well, listen, how many times people have told you a story they have fell down in their house and the dog opened the door, run across to the neighbor, go and get the neighbor, drag them by the collar, and carry them, come back to them in the house. And that dog was never trained to do that. Who told the dog to go do that? I'm just saying. Cats do it. Other persons do it. All of these things do it. Right? God talks to animals. He created them, so why can't he speak their language? So we know that. Now this is the problem. The only problem that I tell persons, listen to this one. The only problem is you must sometimes test the messenger if it's really from God. You got to be careful. Everybody loves to put God in a sentence. And so they come to you and say, Audrey, God told me to tell you. I'm not saying God didn't send you, you know. But I'm saying, if you're not sure, test the waters. Ask God. Listen, let me tell you this. Let me be extremely clear. I put it twice <laughs> so you can get it. Let me be clear. If the messenger is not from God, then the message cannot be from God. You've got to be careful. You know how many persons tell me God told me this? I'll give you this one. I was getting married, engaged to your mother. <laughs> when it was almost there, I was praying to God. God, if this is not the woman I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, let me know. Only person who I was praying that was my brother. I asked him to pray with me. And we were in serious prayer. Everything was going good. The wedding was supposed to go on and everything was looking good. Then, this woman calls me on the phone. And she says to me, I need to speak to you. God gave me a word for you concerning your wife and your marriage. Now, if you're praying something like that, what are you going to do? I found her real quick, right? Because I'm like, okay. Okay, so I'm there. And I'm like, okay. What did God say? I'm kind of fearful, you know, because I really love this woman. And I'm like, oh, well, what did God say? <laughs> this woman says, God says you should not marry this woman. Oh, my heart was broken. My heart was broken. I almost fainted. Until... <laughs> she says, God says you must marry me. <laughs> I was like, you know what? She was just putting in a card for herself. <laughs> yeah. So I'm telling you, people will come and say, and it's a true story. I didn't make that up. It's a true story. My wife and I, we laugh about it all the time. But yeah, so people will come and tell you, God told me this. And God never tell them nothing. Right? So be careful. So let's look in the scripture here now. This is the angel God used to tell somebody. Right? Now, I know some persons are like, angel? Yeah, God still use angel. But listen, if you don't think an angel coming to deliver important information, right, directly, well, I use the big one. This is Mary. This is the birth of Jesus. God didn't talk to Mary directly. He sent an angel. So he can send anybody he chooses as a messenger. It says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. And his kingdom will never end. Look at that. The angel carried a good message. No, I tell everybody, if an angel come to you and appear to you, you better listen. Right? No, some person like, but pastor, that, I didn't see no angel in my life. No, let me tell you this. How many persons believe God still use angels to talk to us? Oh, thank you, Jesus. This morning, everybody went, well, listen. I'm going to tell you this. Now all the time you know it's an angel. 
God will change his means and how he does stuff. Again, you don't need to clear it with Mario. He does it whatever way he wants to do it. And I know some people are like, how are you so sure about that? Well, this time he said it in the word. Look at this. Hebrews 13 verse 2. Do not forget or neglect or refuse to extend hospitality to strangers in, your, in the brotherhood, being friendly, cordial, and gracious, sharing comforts of your home, doing your part generously. With who? Strangers and the people, the people you don't know. Listen to what it says. For through it some of you have entertained who? Angels without knowing it. How many times are you in Walmart and your day is crashing and things are going bad? You're pushing your car slumped over and somebody say, hey, how you doing? You're like, I don't want to talk right now. And the person says, you know, da -da 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 -da, and they just say something and it just blesses your heart and revives your spirit. And then some purposes are going to do suicide. And because that one person talked to them, they don't bother with it. And then guess what? They say, I need to find that person. And so they go back to Walmart and never find that person again. And we are thinking, I wonder where they live. Probably they never lived on earth. God sent an angel. If you don't believe me, take him up with this scripture. I didn't write the Bible. He says, you're going to entertain angels unaware. Well, let me tell you this to help you out. Any stranger can be an angel sent to give you a message. So guess what? Treat everyone with respect. You could be disrespecting God's messenger. That puts a whole perspective on things now. You gotta be careful of some of the things we wanna say. <laughs> because you never know, you could be entertaining angels. So if an angel comes to you, you might not know, but he still uses that method. Now, this one here is a direct one where God told somebody something to tell somebody. And I always tell the persons, if somebody come to you and say, God says it must line up. If it don't line up, run. Because these people are false. Now look at Elijah. It says, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilgad said to Ahab, As the Lord of God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my house. <coughs> Can you imagine me going down to Lebanon court office? There shall be no rain. There shall be no dew until I say so. My God, God told me to say that. Oh, they would lock me in a straight jacket. <laughs> but guess what? What happened if there was no rain? Then people would come to me. <coughs> wouldn't they? Think about it. They would now come to me and say, where did you get this message? <coughs> oh, you get what I'm saying? So this is what Elijah did. Go and tell Ahab there will be no rain. God told him to say that. And I always tell persons, if God tell me to sell Carol something, I know what Carol said, God said. Carol, Carol says, how did you know God is already being magnified right there? Because there's no way Mario could have known. But half the time we use the word God in it, God never told us. That's how we try to fuck with people. <laughs> Make people believe that God said so. Right? If God speaks to someone, it must line up. So be careful of these false prophets and these false persons that come in to tell you things. This is how God, I was reading an article the other day and, and the, this prophet was claiming the best way to heal a woman of their disease, he has to feel them up. Serious thing, this is what's going on in some churches. This other one, he says he has to suck the demon out of you so you have to kiss him. No. Serious things. And there was this one pastor I've been following up and I was praying I said, please don't let this man be fake but I don't trust it. And I said, God, please forgive my unbelief. Well, all of a sudden, he pulled a prank the other day, say he raised a man from the dead. We going to find out the man was working for him. Be careful of these persons who said God told them to tell you, right? If you're not sure, ask God for confirmation. He will send undoubting proof. It's God. You're not sure. God, this man came and told me you said that. If it's true, you got you to gotta let me know. Send somebody else. If you're only talking to God, then only he would know you said that. The other person couldn't know. Right? So talk to God. Right? It lined up with Ahab. Ahab never saw rain for three and a half years. Not only rain, no dew. Can you imagine he get up early in the morning 
And water droplets used to form on the leaves. He can't use the water droplets now put in a glass. Not even due for three years. Three and a half years, no rain. Yeah? James tells us, tells us in the book of James. Right? Now, this is when somebody comes and gives the word and says, God says. Now, this one lined up. I'm going to show you one that didn't line up. Very carefully. Now, this man of God, wonderful man of God in the beginning, God said, go and tell the king, I said this. Then God said to him, he said, when you leave that man of, when you leave that king, don't eat no bread from nobody, don't drink no water from, don't do anything, come home back, don't waste no time, come home back, don't even walk the same way you walk. That's what God said to him. And so, this is what the man of God did. Now another prophet claiming to be a man of God is riding after him because he didn't hear what God said. Because God stopped talking to him. Long time. And so he wants to know what God said. So this is what he do. And he rode after the man of God. And he found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, Are you the man of God from Judah? And he says, I am. He replied, So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. And this is what the man of God said. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you. Nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. Specific instructions. I want you to listen to what the other man of God says, the false man. The old prophet said, I too am a prophet. Careful of these persons who are up there. That everybody who up there and saying their pastor or this or that or come to your house to pray for you. I, will, I remember one time when a lady said she was going to have prayer at her house. I said, who coming to do prayer? Deacon. I said, Deacon and who? Deacon alone coming to a prayer meeting at a lady house. I said, mm -mm, it don't work like that. Why you can't call the rest of the people to come pray with him? He going to pray for something else. <laughs> I'm telling you. So look what the old prophet answered. I too am a prophet as you are. And he started using the words that the other man did. And an angel said to me, by the word of the Lord. He used it back the same words. Bring him back with you to your house so he that he may eat bread and drink water. But the Bible put in brackets, but he was lying to him. Can you imagine that? Because somebody come and put the Lord in there, he believed him. He didn't even ask God. If he had asked God, God would have probably struck down that man at the same time. You know what happened to him? I tell you for this. Consequences will follow if this is a false message. He got the false message. He went and ate with him. On his way back, he riding home on his donkey. And a lion came, took him off the donkey and killed him. Because God said, you disobeyed me. And when God killed him with the lion, the donkey stood right here. Beside the body and the lion stood right here, sitting next to the body. And people passed, going into the city, see a lion and a donkey just guarding the body. And they were able to come and take the body. And neither the donkey nor the lion did anything to them. Right? False message has consequences. Right? So you have to be careful. Right? So I'll leave you with this last story. Then I have the last page after this. This story now. When I was in Lancaster Bible College, I had a few months to go to graduate. And just as I was getting ready to graduate, start filling out applications to come to different churches. I'm filling out all applications. I don't even know where I'm sending some of them. All over the country. So I'm there at the computer. Computer room in the library. Filling out information. Some of you might know my friend that comes here sometimes. Not Anita. The other short one named Mary. So Mary is sitting across from me. I didn't see her that day. And Mary looks across to me at the computer and says, Mario? She gets up from her and says, Mario? If God sends you to an all-white church, would you go? Eh? Sure. She sat down back and she continued doing what her Next week, I'm there again sending out, because I have that particular free time in the week, so that's why I go to the, the library to send out all the rest. And I'm there again another week. This time I saw Mary. Hey, Mary. I'm doing that all of a sudden. I see Mary go, Mario? If God sent you to an all-white church, would you go? Huh? Yeah, sure. Third week. I come in. I see her this time. I'm talking to her. You okay, Mary? You good? Yeah? You good? Okay. Send it. Type it. 
she gets up on the seat, she comes around to me. And she says, Mario, if God sent you to all my church with me, I say, okay. This is the third time you're asking me this question. Why keep asking me the same question? And she said to me, I don't know, God keep on saying I must ask you the question. And I said to her, but I answered already, didn't I say yes all the time? She said, you said yes, but you didn't commit. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you just answered, but you didn't commit, you didn't mean it. I'm like, yeah, that's true, I just said yes, because you're bugging me, I'm trying to send out applications here, <laughs> and stuff. And I said, okay. And then she just went back and she just sat down and continued doing her work. You know what I did? I took that as a what? Sign. What do I do? I go home, pray, ask God, are you saying something to me? Are you speaking to me? I want, and then I committed myself and I said, God, wherever you want to send me, send me. I don't care. I'm committing myself to you. So whether it's a white church, whether it's a Spanish church, whether it's a Chinese church, I don't care. Wherever you want, send me. You see, the next time I saw her in there, she came in. I started typing, but I was slow this time because I'm like, and she said, everything okay, Mario? I'm like, yeah. She didn't say anything to me, so I kept on typing. And believe you me, I'm sitting there looking at, and then I hear my phone ring. <laughs> I'm like, hello? This is Talpa Hawking Church, and we want you to come in for an interview. What's a Talpa Hawking? <laughs> That's what I said to them. We all know what the story ended. <laughs> True story. Right? So God will send somebody to, to you. It must line up. So always remember that. If the person says it's from God, it must line up. It line up there with my friend. So finally, is God still speaking? Yes, he is. Now he may go silent because sin is blocking communication. That's with anybody who has sin in their life. You go silent. Remember one time he did speak to the children of Israel for 400 years. We, we think we can keep malice. <laughs> But if you are not in God's good book, you'll stop speaking, right? But look at this. But once the lines are clear, he speaks to us to various forms. And he's still speaking and will continue speaking. But I tell everybody this. The bigger question is this. Are we listening? You see, people are wondering, is God still speaking? But that's not the big question. Can God never stop speaking? Once we're in the right path, he continues speaking. The bigger question is this. Are we listening? Because guess what? God will speak, 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 and if you're not listening, 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 then nothing will get done. So that is the bigger question. And that's Bible study for today.